I'd like to welcome everybody to the 2021 Town of Kensington Candidates Forum. Because we're in an odd numbered year, that means that this year's election is for two seats on the town council. We have three candidates who have uh, been nominated to run for those two seats. They are alphabetically by last name, Darren Bartram, Connor Crimmins, and Tim Willard. Um, I just want to, um, I've been asked to remind everyone who's on this as a non-participant to please keep your, um, keep on mute and on stop video. Um, the format for tonight's forum, there, each candidate will give an opening statement for 90 seconds. We will then go to um, some questions that have been prepared. Um, I will note that uh, according to our usual um, rules, um, residents were invited to provide questions and all the questions that they have provided um, will be used uh, since we didn't receive enough questions to fill in the entire night. Um, I, I have also prepared some questions in order to um, hit certain topics um, of interest. After we go through the question period, um, each, each candidate will have 60 seconds to answer um, each question. All questions will be directed to all three candidates. When we get to the end of the questions, uh, each candidate then will be invited to provide a closing statement, uh, which is also can be up to 90 seconds. I have with me uh, tonight, um, Rob Sachs, who is going to be our timekeeper. And we have um, apprised the candidates of our signals for when they get close to the end of their allotted time for their um, statements and or their responses. With that, I, I believe we're ready to kick off. Once again, please, if you are a non-participant, stay on mute and stop video. We, uh, through a very complicated system, came up with the order of uh, presentations tonight for the various segments for the opening. We will start with Darren Bartram. Hi, I'm Darren Bartram been on the town council since 2013 and, and was deeply involved in town issues prior to that. Simply put, I think this is a great town. I'm trying to do, do what I can do to help Kensington thrive in present times and to prepare for where we see this town going. Obviously, traffic divides us. It makes it difficult to get around safely and efficiently, particularly during rush hour. A project that you've probably heard a lot about, Summit Avenue Extension, has the potential to divert traffic that simply wants to go through town as opposed to into town and can provide meaningful relief. It's a critical important, critically important project to me. Uh, there are other projects that we're working on. We have already seen the installation of an enhanced pedestrian crossing on Summit Avenue, and we're expecting another one on Metropolitan this year. We as a town have embraced two related concepts, Vision Zero and Complete Streets, which have moved considerations of pedestrian safety and bicyclist safety to the forefront of planning, and it's something that I'm committed to. I'm also committed to measured development of our town. If there's one thing we've seen in nearby communities, it's that more people who live within and above commercial sectors help ensure the success of businesses, including restaurants and shops. I support this effort, although significantly scaled back from what we say, see in places like Silver Spring and Bethesda, which are served by Metro. I'm hoping to earn your vote for another term on the council. Thank you, Darren. Our second uh, opening statement will be provided by Connor Crimmins. Good evening. First, thank you to Sean and Rob for helping to facilitate tonight's forum. My name is Connor Crimmins. My wife, Casey and I, along with our four kids, Finn, Dex, Paji, and Eva, have lived in the town since 2014. I'm an owner of a software company that specializes in performance management with much of my work dedicated to serving our federal government customers. I was first elected to the town council in 2017. And during the four years that I've been on the council, I've chaired the Greenscape Committee where I helped the town to secure a grant to build the picnic pavilion at St. Paul Park. I've been chair of the development review board 
where with the help of Councilmember Bartram, we drafted the DRB's first guidelines and development questionnaire, which have significantly aided the DRB in its review of numerous projects across the town. And as chair, I testified against the self storage project, ultimately resulting in a denial by the hearing examiner. I've advocated for our small businesses, especially during COVID, where I moderated a Zoom panel with County Council Member Andrew Friedson and County Health Officer Travis Gale on reopening Montgomery County with COVID protocols. I also helped to host a panel on uh, helping our businesses navigate the Small Business Administration's Paycheck Protection Program to help them tap into much needed financial resources during the pandemic. I've also helped to secure several pedestrian safety improvements, working with state and county transportation officials. And I've worked hard to increase transparency and communication related to the town's work. If reelected, I'd like to continue my focus on desirable, compatible development, supporting our small business community, and continuing to improve Kensington's small charm, walkability, and quality of life. Finally, a thank you to all of you that are watching at home. I hope that I have gained your trust in being reelected to the town council. Thank you, Connor. And third, Tim Willard. Okay, first I'd like to thank uh, all the people who organized this event and I'd like to thank Sean for moderating it and everybody who's watching it. My name is Tim Willard and I have lived in Kensington for nearly 30 years. My three children all came up through the Walter Johnson cluster and my grandson is now at KP. I have been active in a variety of different organizations, including the Montgomery County Civic Federation, Montgomery County Faith Alliance for Climate Solutions, and the Silver Spring Justice Coalition. I've watched Kensington change and grow without ever losing its walkable small town atmosphere. The new businesses we've brought in have been wonderful. The reason why I'm running for the town council now is that we are facing new challenges that may require a more proactive approach. The, the county is proposing a new master plan that could change single family neighborhoods to allow multiple family units. More concerning are proposals to designate the, our mark station as a metro stop, which would allow much higher density <clears throat> development in Kensington. I believe these kind of changes uh, could uh, bring the end to a, 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 the type of town we want to see. I would like to see the town government take the lead in advocating with the county for the Kensington we all know and love. Okay, thank you, Tim. So uh, now I'm going to ask the candidates a series of questions. Um, I'm hoping it would, that the questions just start a conversation among the candidates. Um, we will go in a, in a set order. Um, and so just to get started, I, I have to comment on the fact that here we are, we're, we're on a Zoom meeting in order to have this, um, to have this forum. Um, I so enjoyed during my time on the council and, and, when, and, and when others were running, having the ability to have everybody come together. We've been experiencing a, a pandemic which has wreaked havoc and real damage on the lives, health and well being, both physical and mental, of people, caused upheaval on many people's employment status and personal finances. And it's put a crimp on the economy and the financial health of businesses, big and small. I know I'm getting to a question. I would like each candidate to comment on your own personal reflections, what you've seen in the town and its residents, how the town is doing and how we seem as a town and, and as, in, as residents, as we seem to be poised to finally emerge from under the effect of the pandemic. I'm gonna start with Connor. Uh, Sean, I, thank you. This is a great question. This is exactly what the town has been facing for the last year. Um, first, the thing that's special about Kensington is our high level of civic connectedness. This is something we have a really strong sense of community and that's what's gonna help pull our community through COVID even better. But examples of this, when COVID hit, uh, there were things like the farmer's market that were at risk of being shut down. And uh, Mayor Furman stepped up and with myself and, and Council Member Bartram, 
we, we just started volunteering every Saturday to put up cones, put up queues and lines, get it organized so that the county health department could, could sign off that we could keep it open as a food source for our community. As I mentioned in my opening, as a small business owner myself, I saw what was happening to businesses and I realized there were a lot of federal, state and county funds out there, but a lot of small businesses just don't know how to tap into it. So I volunteered working with the mayor to develop a program to, to teach our small businesses how to apply for the PPP loans, to get our county council member and the, the health officer together to also walk them through exactly how to reopen and reopen safely under the Montgomery County guidelines. Okay. And I apologize, Connor, I may have asked a question that was longer than 60 seconds, but I appreciate your answer. Uh, Tim, I'm going to kick it over to you. What, what, are your, what, what are you seeing? How, what are your observations as to how the town and its residents are doing as we seem to finally be seeing the light at the end of the tunnel? Uh, well, I think the town has been doing very well. Um, I, I think, and part of that is just the, the community spirit in Kensington. We, we seem to have come through the um, pandemic with uh, um, very minimal damage. You know, most of our businesses are still here. We're, the uh, community is supporting them all. Um, so I'm very happy with uh, how the last year has gone. Um, and I'm really looking toward that community spirit to help us face uh, new challenges that are coming um, down the line. Okay. Darren? Well, I agree with the previous two that we've weathered this well. In, in some ways, I think that's a, a we, we approached this whole pandemic from a position of privilege in that we were, were able to suddenly work from home. I had started before the pandemic uh, trying to use Facebook Live to broadcast our town meetings. And then um, along came Zoom and, and uh, municipal cable folks. And we were able to seamlessly sort of move to that. And then through our listserv and our Facebook group, we rallied people to um, support the businesses. Don't forget about them. Don't stay in your house. Uh, you know, Get takeout from the stores that were open. Um, having now that we're on the verge of reopening, I think it's a time to sort of revisit some assumptions that we've had. So I don't know that traffic is going to go back to the way it was. And if that's the case, then let's take advantage of that and fix some things that have been unfixable. Okay, that's, that's, um, that's actually a, a good jumping off point for uh, my follow up. So for, uh, aside from sort of generally the town, how, how do you think the town government has done in its role with the town in, uh, in the face of the pandemic? And have, have we learned lessons and are there things that we have done that are now, you know, may change the way that we do things in the future? Um, you know, even, even, even once the pandemic has, has uh, finally subsided. Tim, do you have any thoughts on uh, things, lessons that, that you've learned that the town might take up? Yeah, I, I think it's hard to know what lessons we have to learn until we get completely out of the mm -hmm. pandemic. I mean, how much is traffic going to come back? Is the metro system going to come back to what it used to be? It's, it's still hard to tell questions like this and, uh, you know, what sort of impact they're going to have. So I think we still need to, uh, to monitor these things. I think there's one area where the town did learn a good lesson and that was with the uh, self storage unit that was proposed on, uh, on Connecticut. Um, you know, I think nobody in the, in the town wanted to see this and uh, we, the town government did eventually get it canceled, but, um, some, you know, sometimes developers think that the, you give them, a, give them a little bit of leeway and, and they're good. And I think maybe we need to be more proactive in, uh, in expressing the town's views. Okay. Dar Darren? 
Sure. Le lessons, I mean, lessons learned, things that we can use going forward. Yeah, to, and I'll, I want to stick to your question, and maybe we'll get to self storage later. But I, I do think that uh, the ability to engage town residents is critical. Um, I, over my eight years on the council, we have tried repeatedly to uh, make sure that we hear from from residents. We send out uh, the required legal notices of meetings and agendas and things, but then we also supplement that with with posts to the listserv and to Facebook. And I, I think the advent of Zoom and you know, first Facebook Live through my you know, sort of haphazard methods, but then Zoom makes it so that people who you know, have kids, have a busy evening, can participate. Um, I, I wanna get past where we make um, decisions on code changes based on one public comment. I want people to feel like they can engage with us and that we'll hear them and that we'll listen and, and incorporate that into the record. That's all. Okay, thank you. So Connor, let me, let me also throw in Connor. So uh, as a result of um, the last election and the way that we conducted it, I believe that we had record participation. Um, is, is, that another, is that another lesson or do you have any other lessons that we've learned from that? Yeah, I, I think there are several lessons that the town government has learned. Darren touched on Zoom meetings, right? To start there, I really, I'm a technophile. I love the idea of Zoom meetings. We help to wire up town hall to be completely wireless so that we could try and push the council towards being a more connected body. And I think it would be good to continue with online meetings. I'd like to go back to being in person but with an online capacity so that we have the ability to reach both populations. I also think during COVID, we did a phenomenal job in our outreach to businesses, but this was a lesson learned. We had a, a style of outreach to them that worked pre-COVID and we really had to uh, roll up our sleeves and get to know all of our businesses and their needs a lot better. And that is a, a very positive lesson that we learned. Additionally, the relationships that we've had to double down on with state and local you know, county officials. But to your question, Sean, Yes, we had record turnout. We also had a contested council election. We also had a contested, contested mayoral election, which we have not had in over a decade. And so this was really, really positive to see the energy around those elections with the advent of mail-in mail voting. We have a mail-in capacity this year, and I think it's worthy to continue examining whether or not mail-in voting is something we should continue going forward. Okay. Hi. <clears throat> so there, there, we may... It may be that there's a silver lining coming out of, of this in the, in the way the town has operated. Um, one of the little bits of wisdom, I, I, I'm going to get some eye rolls probably, you know, talking again about the fact that I spent some time on the council. But one of the, one of the bits of wisdom that I learned was that if you want to know, if you really want to take a look at the values and priorities of an entity or a town government, you look at its budget. And... I'm not going to ask, I'm not going to get into the weeds on the budget, but I just want to use that as a jumping off point to ask, um, does the town have its values and priorities straight when it comes to the way it spends its money and the, and, and the things that it's pursuing? Uh, are there things that, we sh that the town should be spending more on, things that the town should take up that, that, may, that may require expenditure that we haven't before? And are there areas where we spend too much? For that, I'm going to start with Darren. Sure. Well, I, 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 let me start off by saying, Sean, we all appreciate your 10 years <laughs> that you re yeah. often remind us you spent on the council and in charge of the budget. And I, and I think it left us in a good place. We are somewhat insulated from some of the pressures that the larger municipalities have. We don't, we, so for the pandemic, we were not relying on um, hospitality taxes, restaurants and, and um, hotels paying us you know, a portion of their room fees. And so last year during the mayoral election, I remember a lot of fear tactics of saying we needed an emergency fiscal plan. And because our revenues are fairly steady, we, I think we weathered the pandemic very well. Um, I, I think that as far as what we spend I don't think we spend too much money on particularly anything. I think that we probably want to spend a little bit more money on economic development because it really is the uh, the, the future of our town. Okay. Connor, how are we doing on spending yeah. money? I think we're doing really well. Um, as we went into the pandemic, you know, we made a pledge as a council to be very conservative with how we spent money. 
um, because we were unsure what the revenues would be coming in. The revenues were very good. Um, I think our priorities, to your point, are are really, really solid. Our largest uh, buckets of spending tend to be around public safety and around people. Um, so this is, you know, we have engaged with Montgomery County Police to try and help with some of our traffic issues. We started with two officers that grew into three officers on a part-time basis. And in our new budget for the next FY, we're increasing that to four officers because what we're hearing from constituents is they wanna see more presence around school bus stops, around high um, traffic enforcement areas. We're also putting money toward people. We've got a great staff at Town Hall, an amazing staff. But part of that's because we do well at, at hiring good people and then retaining them. The other thing that I think we do a phenomenal job at is just our constituent services, right? In the rest of the county, you have one, one time a week garbage. Uh, we've got twice a week garbage. We've got plowing that is, is off the charts better than anywhere else in the county. And that's all because we have a, a solid focus on where our, our budget goes. Thank you, Connor. Tim, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to slight, slightly frame the question differently uh, for you since, since um, you were not on the council with the budget. I, I, I just want to ask you, do you have specific things in mind that the, that the town is not doing where you think the town should focus its efforts and money on programs? And are there, are there things where you see that the, the town doing that, that maybe they could take a, their foot off the gas a little bit on? Well, um, you know, I think we have to keep in mind that we are a small town with a small budget. And we, because of that, we do have to be a bit conservative about how we spend our money. I, I think all in all, uh, our general priorities are, are good. And uh, we should keep, uh, um, we should keep on the same basic path. I think there's a lot we can do um, by just educating the, the, the town population on, on things that they can do to help improve situations. And I'm thinking particularly of things like, uh, you know, rain gardens, which are subsidized by the county and, and many people don't know this. Um, so just, just, I think more education can help do things that would, the town budget may not have the money for. All right, thank you for that. A um, little bit, of, I think this is a, a, a bit of a shorter answer, but going from the spending side to the, to the revenue side, um, do, do you all feel that the tax burden on town residents as it relates to taxes collected by the town, are, are they at the right level? Um, should we be looking to cut them? Should we be looking to raise more? And to, to Darren's point, where he mentioned uh, what other uh, municipalities have as sources, should we be looking to other sources for, for funding our government? Um, for that one, I'm gonna start with Connor. Great. Um, actually, you know, on the revenue side, our, you know, like our personal property tax rate has actually been steady for I believe the last four FYs and actually came down from the previous two FYs before that. Um, so thank you, council member McMullen that happened during your tenure uh, on, the counting, on, the, on the council. But it shows a priority that, that we are keeping that tax rate for our residents stable, right? We are prioritizing that, that we don't need to rely on the residents like a lot of the other jurisdictions around us do. We have a very strong and robust business community. To a point made earlier, economic development is, is going to be the next thing we really need to do as we come out of, of COVID. We have 240 some odd businesses located here in Kensington, but we have many more that want to be here. We have many more that are rebounding back. We have available space for them. There are obviously development projects that are going to bring additional businesses here. As far as other revenue sources, we have the opportunity to get that additional revenue by bringing in these additional businesses that want to be here right in, in the heart of Kensington. Okay. Uh, Tim, th thoughts on, on our tax burden on our residents and or potential other sources of funding? Well, I, I agree with Connor. I'm, I'm pretty much a fiscal conservative. I don't think we need to raise any taxes. I mean, we, ha we have great services as it is, 
And uh, if we continue to attract more um, good businesses to the town, we will increase our revenue that way. Uh, so, um, so I broaden would, the base, broaden the base, broaden the base and pretty much uh, <clears throat> steady as she goes, I think. Darren, do you agree with all that? I, I do. I've not heard from anybody who said our taxes are too high I, and, and we are very connected with the residents in town. Um, I think, you know, obviously people do pay a little more in taxes to live in within the town than outside. But as Connor mentioned, we provide twice a week trash collection. I, I think our streets are better maintained than anybody else. When you know, we haven't had a lot of snowfall in recent years, but when we get snowfall, we're plowed out before anybody else. And, and um, so I think that, that the, the value that those additional taxes provide is recognized. The only, this, is, this will be a technical uh, point, but there's a constant yield factor in, in the state where if you get more revenue, you are supposed to cut the rate to match that. I think if we get additional residents in the apartments or in, in houses that um, we, we probably wanna keep the rate level, even though they're under this weird only in Maryland approach, that would be considered a tax increase. I, I think our taxes should stay level. Um, <clears throat> there was mention, I believe by, by Tim, about our services. We have a town staff that performs work, maintenance, landscaping all around town. I guess I'm kind of in a way giving a shout out to Jason and his team because uh, for the great work that they do. But it also wasn't too long ago that the town staff also collected trash and recycling, but that function was outsourced. So my question, how do you see the balance of the town's outsourcing of certain functions while also while keeping other functions in-house? And are there either functions you'd like to see outsourced or functions that you would like to see brought back in-house? Start with um, with Tim on this one. Yeah, I, I think the balance is uh, working quite well now. Um, all of our services are very good. Uh, and I would hesitate to change anything unless there was a problem that came up. You know, if it's if it's not broke, don't fix it. Okay, Darren, we have a good balance of uh, outsource versus in-house. I think we approach services like we do booze. We used to be a dry town, and then we um, we changed incrementally. And, and the most recent change was basically to, you know, allow bars and restaurants to serve alcohol um, throughout the town. Uh, and there were fears at the beginning when we did this. We went through a referendum to see, should we? And there was some opposition to it. And we, uh, by going incrementally, we gave people comfort that we were doing it the right way. We also had concerns about outsourcing trash. We heard concerns that the trash men knew us. They knew when we were out of town, they looked after our house. And so we, we did it and we found that those concerns weren't really um, warranted. And, and so it worked. Um, I don't know that there are many other services that we could outsource at this point though. So I, I, I think trash recycling, you know, if we get to the point where we wanna consider outsourcing, um, well, we already contract with, with road maintenance, but maybe snow plowing, but I think we're at a good good level at this point. Okay. Connor, you agree? I do, I agree. I think the things that we've decided to outsource make sense. They're high capital intensive activities, garbage pickup, all the equipment that goes into it, the labor and hours that go into it. Um, you know, Another thing we outsource, because we don't have it, but the town did way back when is policing. We, we do not keep a police force. We contract with Montgomery County Police Department. We are uh, adding additional revenue in the next FY budget to increase that. I think that was something we heard from residents and the council is positively reacting to that. Um, you know, I, I also think, you know, road maintenance. These are other capital intensive, um, highly specialized things that we don't need our public works to be doing. There are experts out there that I think we are properly uh, outsourcing to. Okay. All right. So I'm going to turn from sort of the, sort of the nuts and bolts, the generalities of uh, the town and town government and get into the um, a hotter button issue of development in the town. Um, 
it's it's been about nine years. I looked this up. Nine years ago, the county council gave final approval to the the current Kensington sector plan. If you read the town of Kensington website. The plan creates a long-term planning framework for Kensington, including a reinvigorated town center. The website goes on to suggest that the new plan generally retains existing densities using mixed use zones and describes that to allow residential development along with commercial uses. The zones which require developers to provide public benefits will result in well-designed projects on livelier streets that include wide tree-lined sidewalks. And it goes on from there, including opportunities to preserve neighborhood businesses. The question, so we have construction going on at some sites in town. We have some banners and signs promoting future development on other sites. Are the development opportunities that the town has either, that have already been improved, approved and or construction has started or even completed in town or the other proposals that are being presented to the town, are they consistent with the promise that the Kensington sector plan had set forth when it was uh, approved nine years ago. I think I met Darren with this one. Well, as somebody who has supported each of the projects in their final stage, I think that the development that we're seeing is consistent with the sector plan. There were projects like the Knowles Manor Senior Apartments, which we uh, reviewed and we, we recognized that that site is very difficult access wise and it feeds onto a major road and the project as presented was simply too tall and didn't provide enough parking. Uh, through negotiations with the applicant, we uh, got them to agree to chop a level off the floor, off the building. So it went from six stories down to five stories, which was clearly within the height and the density of, of the sector plan. So I, th I think that, um, you know, that that's an example of where, yes, we do have uh, some powerful tools uh, to use to control development. We have a supermajority requirement that we can trigger, and uh, we have the sector plan, which really lays out a, a stringent framework. Uh, so far, I think we've been responsible, and I think the unanimous vote of the council to, su to support these projects has reflected that. Okay. Connor, are, are we getting the kinds of projects that we had hoped for and that are consistent with the plan? Well, I think that's two different questions and I'll try and answer them both. Are we getting projects that are consistent with the plan? Yes, I do believe that we are. As Darren mentioned, if you go through and look at them in final stage, they are compatible with what our sector plan is looking for. We are putting density into the commercial core. That's where taller buildings are. Um, the problem is that some of the things within the sector plan though, envisioned aggregating lots. So you look at different sectors of the town and it, you know, the dream was that, hey, these three parcels going all the way back, a, you know, a city block would all combine together and we'd create a town center. And that's a wonderful vision, but the reality is they're owned by different people. And so the struggle has been that we're not able to fully realize some of what the sector plan puts out because we don't own the property and the people that do don't want to combine them. The other challenge that we have is that while we are working off of the sector plan, which was you know, as, as you mentioned, ratified in 2012, some of the goalposts keep getting moved by the county council. There are multiple zoning text amendments that have been introduced and passed since 2012 that impact our development footprint, especially as it relates to how tall and dense a building can be. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Tim. Again, from the from the perspective of someone who's who's uh, been in town for thirty years, and you were here when the sector plan was put into place, um, are are you are we getting the the kinds of projects that you think that that you thought we were going to be getting? Well, just generally, um, I remember the debate about uh, the sector plan. It was very ro robust and uh, even heated sometimes. But the thing is, we got our sector plan passed and just not too long after that, the county passed a new zoning uh, ordinance that pretty much did away with the, all the height densities that we had agreed on. So we, uh, the planning here in Kensington is very much dependent on what uh, the county does and, and they are coming up with very new Sec uh, very new zoning 
requirements. They're coming up with a new master plan that could change everything. Um, I, I have no problem with what has been done so far, but I think we have to keep a very close eye on what the county is doing from now on. Um, <clears throat> Connor, I think this one starts with to you. Um, you mentioned um, your participation on uh, a body known as the Development Review Board. Um, it was created by the count, mayor and council in order to take the point on reviewing proposed development. Um, <clears throat> and that body holds public meetings, makes presentations and recommendations to mayor and council. My, my question is, based on the, the current system of a mayor and, and council meetings and the existence and uh, participation of the Development Review Board, do, do we currently have a system in town that allows for adequate participation of the town residents in the, uh, in the preliminary process of, uh, review of reviewing of these proposals? And does, it, does, does our current system, the, again, recognize two questions. Does the current system allow for adequate say by the town itself as to um, you know, develop, developers' proposals when it comes to um, come time for approval? Sure. Well, first, I do think that we have an adequate system for reviewing these and for the public process to occur and for our residents to engage. Prior to COVID and us adopting Zoom, just like any other public meeting, be it at the county level or the state level, if you weren't able to get to town hall on the night and the hour that the DRB was meeting, then you weren't able to participate. And that, that is a limiting function. That's how a lot of public meetings are set to occur. The advent of Zoom and us adopting it because of COVID has largely removed that restriction. We have much more participation because people are able to log in from home. I'd like to continue doing that because I, I'm a firm believer in the public process. I want more input, especially early on. Now, for the question of, does the DRB have enough leverage or input in the overall development? Yes and no. Developers are responsive to our inquiries and our questions. But to a point that Tim was alluding to, we don't have zoning authority within the town. It all resides with the county. The county has the final say on all projects. So while we are trying to be an influencing force through our DRB and town and council uh, resolutions, at the end of the day, without zoning authority, the council, the county council can overrule us. Okay. Tim, what are your observations on this? Does the town have in place uh, adequate system? Them for citizens to participate? And do you feel as if the town has a, a, an adequate um, ability for say so when it comes time for these, for when these proposals come up? Um, I think the town does uh, everything that it, it's required to do. And uh, I think they, like Connor said, uh, Zoom has helped broaden the ability uh, for people to participate, but I still feel that uh, many people in the town just are not aware of, of these development meetings and what is happening, what is being proposed. And I would sit, like to see more communication, you know, through social media and other things uh, to let the town uh, citizenship know what's going on. Um, and it, it is true that uh, we are all dependent on what on the final say of the county council. But if we make enough noise, we can have an influence on what they say. Okay, Darren, same questions. Sure. Um, I would say that the um, sometimes I think some people misunderstand the purpose of the development review board. It is not to approve or disapprove a project or put it in a position where the fix is in. It is to ask questions to the developer, to point to parts of the sector plan that the project may not um, have paid attention to. And it's to get it ready for council action. That said, I, I think we allow participation at the DRB through questions submitted to us. And, and when it comes to the council, 
and, and there are community meetings and there are public meetings. Um, that's where really the public input is, is the most uh, applicable. There was some criticism last year that the DRB didn't shut down the self-storage project at the outset. And I, I have to tell you that would have been a huge mistake because when we got to the Board of Appeals for review of that project, the hearing examiner gave great weight to the fact that we had followed the same process for that self-storage project that we followed for all the other projects in town. And so I think it's a process we have to follow because it's the way we set it up and, 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 it, and it, it benefits us all to have done that. Let me, let me sort of flip, flip this around a little bit. A town resident in a question has expressed what I can best summarize as a mixture of both concern, but, but also confusion about development, the process for obtaining approvals, the language of zoning codes, the carefully crafted pronouncements and promises of potential developers. And the resident believes that despite the best efforts of town officials through things like the Development Review Board, there's a real challenge in communicating the issues surrounding a potential project to busy town residents and to make such communication in easy to understand accessible language. So my question for all the candidates, do you share the resident's concern about getting clear, concise information to residents about the complexities of future development projects proposed for the town? Tim? Uh, yeah, I very, very much share that concern. Uh, I'll just note here that uh, this year, the County Council had a proposal to require all developers to sign their plans and get them notarized. And uh, the developers uh, fought against that because, you know, they thought it was too much of a burden. So they don't necessarily have to tell the truth on their plans. But uh, we definitely need uh, more outreach to our town, um, to our township, to our members, our, our citizens, and, and do everything we possibly can to get them all involved in the process. Okay. Darren, do you have a, do you share the resident's concern about the, the need and ability to get clear, concise information to the residents about these projects? Sure. Um, I will say that I've, I've lived here for 24 years, and in that time, I've had uh, various competing imperatives. I've had kids that were really a priority for a portion of that. Now, you know, most or all but one is gone. Uh, um, and, and I have more time to devote to the issues. I, I don't want people to have to be involved in the town if they don't want to be. But if they want to be, I want to make the messages available to them. And I think we do that. We send out a town journal, which, which frequently describes the pending projects, pending issues, code revisions, charter revisions. Uh, we point them to our website. We often supplement things with, with uh, listserv discussions. So I, I think the opportunities are there for people who are interested in learning about the issues, uh, but we don't, we don't force it on them. Okay, hey, Connor. So, you know, I agree. The public process works when the public is engaged in it, but it's hard. We have, you know, competing priorities. I've got four kids. I own a small business. Um, I, I coach some youth sports, but I still, you know, this is a passion of mine. I love Kensington. I really, really love um, the development aspect of it, but it does. There's a learning curve. There's a steep learning curve. When I first got onto the DRB, there were a lot of terms, ZTA, FAR, MPDUs that I, I was not familiar with. And I reached out first to Darren, I called him and he sat down for an hour and went through it with me. And that's the same kind of thing that we can do for all of our residents. We have the resources at the County Parks and Planning Department to put together a workshop. And so something I'm taking away from this uh, forum tonight is let's just do that. Let's get together, especially now that we have Zoom, get some of the experts from County and build a workshop that helps to demystify all of these acronyms to get thrown around like candy at these meetings, right? ZTAs and MPDUs and FARs, it is complex and it is highly technical, but with a little bit of, of knowledge sharing, I think we can help bring those that really wanna be a part of it, but are intimidated by some of the terms to a higher level of understanding. Okay. 
so I, I'm Tim. I want to go back to a little bit, little bit off our, our normal. Uh, I believe that early on you had mentioned the concept of education, of um, you know the, the need to ed educate our residents. Um, is is Connor's idea a good idea to to uh, put together events like that, where for in order to to uh, in order to uh, fulfill this this mission of education? Yeah, I think Connor's idea is a great idea, uh, and not just in terms of development. Uh, there are a lot of programs the county has, um, and a lot of environmental programs. Uh, the county will give individuals up to $7,000 in rebates for rainscape programs that would help mitigate uh, rainwater runoff, which is becoming a bigger problem as the climate warms up. And we need to, we need to educate the public about all of these programs um, because they will all affect us. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Another town resident had a question related to the issue of dealing with county officials, the approval process, developers. <clears throat> Their question is, does the town now or should the town, if it does not now, reach out to neighboring jurisdictions, such as, to, for example, uh, the Chevy Chase um, municipalities, to try to leverage each other's experience and capabilities in dealing in the approval process. Is there information sharing that's going on out there? And if if not, should it be? Darren? All right. Um, I'm going to defer to Connor to address the, the coordination that we've been doing under Thrive, because it's really him in the lead and, and Tracy. I'll point to another example of coordination, though, that, that I'm spearheading. And that is, um, that there are changes going on at the county level. Specifically, I'm thinking with respect to accessory dwelling units, ADUs, where a homeowner in the R60 zone, which most of us live in, is able to build a, an, a basically a second home on their property. And it's uh, generally tied to proximity to mass transit. But the idea that Mark is anything comparable to Metro is, is laughable. It's one direction, five days a week, one direction during rush hour. So I have been contacting a variety of towns in the area to figure out what are they doing to make sure that, that ADUs reflect what the community is looking for or expecting and not frustrating people who bought into our community expecting a, a single family homes. Connor, Darren deferred to you on part of the part of the response. Are we sure. are are we uh, are we coordinating? Are we leveraging other municipalities' yeah. experience? And we do extensively. I mean, I probably spend three to four days a week, uh, you know, an hour here or there, talking to municipalities and civic organizations all across the county. And Darren alluded to Thrive. So Tim mentioned the the county is looking at redoing what is the general plan? And it's gonna be called Thrive Montgomery 2050. It's the vision for development over the next 30 years. And I had concerns as chair of DRB and looking at the language about, about some of the zoning changes that were occurring. I went to, to Mayor Tracy. Uh, she mentioned that you know Chevy Chase View had sent over some concerns as well. We engaged with them. That brought us into a coalition of 23 different municipalities and civic organizations that represent over 50,000 residents down county that are deeply concerned with some of the changes the county is making. And through that coalition, we have had the opportunity to talk directly one-on-one -on -one with the county executive, four different members of the county council. We've talked with uh, state representatives. We've talked with other congressional representatives to talk about what is going on with Thrive and the vision for Montgomery and to engage them on our concerns, right, as the leaders of these municipalities. But we also do it through municipal, the Maryland Municipal League, Montgomery Chapter. We meet as all of the uh, municipalities within Montgomery County to set a legislative agenda that goes up to Annapolis every year to handle issues that are facing municipalities across the state. So yeah, I mean, we do this every week. Tim, are, are, you, a, are you a collaborator, a, a cooperator? Are you, as a council member, would you be advocating going to these other municipalities in order to uh, leverage your experience? 
Yeah, absolutely. I think it's ne it's absolutely necessary. I've been working with the Montgomery County Civic Federation for several years. Uh, the Civic Federation is a, a combination of local um, uh, local town federations. Uh, there's one in Parkwood. There's one in North Kensington. There isn't any in Kensington. And so we, we sort of get left out. And there's a lot of uh, expertise in this organization. Uh, so that's just one example where, yeah, we should be more involved with, uh, with all the other community organizations that are out there. So <clears throat> something I'm picking up on from, uh, from the discussion tonight um, is, so we've got this proposal that Mark is, is akin to a Metro stop um we've we've uh, had other discussions about suggestions the proposal that the county is making and uh, there are things we disagree with so we have to be a strike force in order to to uh, deal with it um I, i've got a, a, an interesting comment in the chat that what kensington's actually care about not us talking to each other but that priority number one should be to keep the county at bay is the county Right now, when it comes to issues of development, uh, our our uh, our ally or our uh, or our enemy, and do we need to keep them at bay? Connor, that's a fantastic question. Um, the challenge we have with the county around, and I'll, and I'll focus in on Thrive Twenty Fifty, is that a general plan by its nature is a policy document that is somewhat a one size fits all, right? They're looking at the entire county and they're trying to devise what is the best way to build out the county over the next 30 years for all areas. And the problem is all areas aren't the same. Now they, they break it up. They talk about the you know Greenlands area, uh, the agricultural areas, the suburban areas and the highly urban areas. But the difference is the issues that we face here in Kensington, the issues that you'd face in a Gaithersburg or the issues you'd face in a Poolsville are very, very different. And this one size fits all, there is an aspect of me where I kind of, I, I wish we could keep them at bay, right? There's part of me that says, wait, that's why we have a sector plan, right? But now we're likely gonna have to redraft a sector plan 10 years from now or within the next 10 years. And I wish I could, but the problem is we are dependent on the county for a number of functions, zoning being one of them. So you know, zoning and land use all goes through the county. And, and, and so there is no opportunity to truly keep them at bay. We have to work with them as a partner. Okay. Ken, county um, friend or foe? Well, uh, let me start by saying that some of my friends in the Montgomery County Civic Federation have a nickname for the county uh, bureaucracy. They call it Fortress Montgomery. Meaning, you know, they will have all these hearings and let you say your piece, but then they will go ahead and do whatever they wanted to do from <clears throat> from the start. Uh, it's very hard uh, to uh, to influence them, uh, uh, and uh, I don't think the phrase "keeping them at bay" is adequate because they are ever present. We have to figure out how to form coalitions to bring enough pressure on them to move their policy in the direction that, that we want. Aaron? Um, I, yeah, I don't think there's a, 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 a single binary answer for, for the county. I think they have shown themselves to be invaluable to us when they were, the planners were helping to make revisions to the Solera development on the Metropolitan. I think the first iteration of the project was was awful and it was an eyesore. And then they got the sense that what we wanted was a, not they, I mean, the developer got the sense that what we wanted was some faux Victorian look and it almost was worse. And then the planning professional planners put their heads together and came up with sort of an a, 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 um, industrial look for it. And I, and I think that radically improved how the building will appear. Now, there are other parts where the county doesn't necessarily have our, uh, um, have our interests at heart, but we have to do the homework to um, 
explain why we should be left out or given an exemption. And so, for example, we did that in the 2012 timeframe when we were trying to prove that Mark was not Metro. And we got a third standalone parking uh, requirement that applied to Mark that was in between Metro and non-Metro. So we can do it. <clears throat> uh, going from the more general to the specific, um, I want to talk about the plans for Warner Circle. The Montgomery County Parks and Washington Landmark Construction have apparently reached an agreement whereby the manor house and carriage house at Warner Circle will be renovated to create condos while leaving the parkland for public use and occasionally permitted public access to the interior spaces. Is this, is this deal a good thing? Uh, Tim. Well, uh, you know, the negotiations on this have been going on for years. Um, this set, I think any agreement at this point is better than no agreement. And what has been proposed sounds good to me. Uh, I'm, um, unless I learn something drastically different, I would be supportive of it. Okay. Darren, good thing? Warner Circle? Yes, a good thing out of a bad situation. We, we, um, a purchaser bought the nursing home from you know, privately from the developer and set off a panic in town. And 700 people signed a petition to rescue it from a developer who might put up 18 townhomes on the 18 separate lots that surround a circle. So that the county, uh, we used open space money to purchase the land from the developer. And then the counties tried to set about restoring the manor to something that would be, um, you know, restored and, and usable and they just got in over their head in, in, in a lean budget time. So I think it, the proposal that we've gotten, it's the only proposal we've gotten, is a really good one by a developer who has done really just amazing work with other historic buildings and I, and I look forward to the project, to that site being alive again. Connor, thumbs up or thumbs down on the Warner Circle? Agreed. Well, thumbs up. I voted in support of it uh, last week or at our town meeting for the resolution. I, I do. I mean, Darren alluded to a good thing out of a bad situation, but let's also look at a rarity that we have here in town, which is right now this deal, which is sitting with the county executive, has the support of the Friends of Warner Circle, so that's nearby residents in the town of Kensington. It has the support of parks and planning because they cannot afford to maintain this house anymore and they want to see it restored to its proper place. It has the support of historic preservation at the county level, right? They also, you know, that is their business. They want to see it restored. It's at risk right now if a plan, you know, if an agreement isn't reached of going into demolition by neglect. It really is in such poor condition. It also has the support of the town of Kensington. It has support of our, our you know, local uh, state and, and uh, county uh, elected officials. So yeah, I'm desperately waiting to see what the county executive will do. I hope, um, and I, you know, I'm assuming he is tuned in tonight, right? Of course, because what else would you have to do on this Monday night? Um, and if he is, Mr. County Executive, I really do hope that you will sign off on this deal. This is a rare situation when all parties agree that this is a, a virtuous de, uh, agreement to restore this property, maintain the parkland, and bring, you know, uh, restore a beautiful historic home at the same time. Yeah. All right, <clears throat> another, another town resident weighed in on a specific um, issue related to development. I know, shocking. Uh, <laughs> we mentioned the Knowles Manor housing project in the cor course earlier. Um, currently being constructed on Knowles near Connecticut. Uh, <clears throat> during the run up to that, the approval process, a group uh, called the Neighbors for an Improved Kensington opposed the project and eventually reached a settlement with the developer, which included $100,000 in funding to be provided to the town of Kensington to supplement traffic and parking enforcement if, if the town wanted to take the money. The resident asks whether the town should accept these funds. And if so, if so, how how should the town use them, Darren? Sure. Well, the the this group has asked us a couple of times to accept the money, and I have come back to them asking questions about the nature of how 
they got this money? And so far, I have not received a good answer at all, a satisfactory answer for me. The lawsuit that they filed either had merit or it didn't. That's a binary choice. If it had merit, let's just imagine the project didn't provide enough parking spaces and they figured it out and nobody else did. Then what they, the plaintiffs did here was they extracted $100,000 from the developer to cover up an error that should have been fixed by the planning board. That's case one, had merit. Case two is it had no merit. And if it was a frivolous lawsuit brought against a developer faced with expiring bonds, it's kind of a shakedown. So I, I, I wanna know, I, I would love to know more information about how this settlement was arrived. Is it a shakedown? Is it a cover up, Or is it something else that I'm not imagining? Okay. Uh, Connor, should, should the town accept the, these funds? And if so, how should they use them? Sure. Well, in the process of going through this, right? You know, we talked about the public process, which I, I know I'm a, a broken record on. Um, but many of the issues that were brought up as part of their settlement agreement were areas that they were trying to improve on the project. And this goes beyond the $100,000. There are other tangible things that they wanted to see change within the development to make the development better. Many of those things were items that had already come up through the DRB process, had already been agreed to, and were already part of the plan. And you know, it, it struck me as I know we've already had this conversation of it's hard. It's hard to get to all these meetings, especially when these meetings used to be in person and not on Zoom. But the public process was there. This went through the public process and many of those things were addressed. And, and, and I found it unfortunate that it ended up in a lawsuit. But at the end of the day, they have this $100,000 and we've gone back to them on a couple of occasions to ask them how they would want us to spend it, right? How, do, how does that $100,000 improve this project? Just putting it toward parking enforcement when we have the budget to do that. We're demonstrating that with the FY22 budget. We're increasing our spending on Montgomery County Police and traffic enforcement. We're doing that without the need of any developer funds. And so respectfully, I mean, honestly, I think it's a question to, to send back to the friend, you know, the neighborhood for an improved Kensington, the neighbors for improved Kensington, because they've asked us to kind of take a break from it. We took it up. We started to discuss it in, in council. Um, it, they're, they're, they've, it's kind of gone back into their lap. And so I, you know, I, I'd okay. leave it with them. Okay. Tim, should the town council accept the funds? Well, just as a general rule, if, if somebody's willing to give us money, I would say take it. Uh, that's a little flippant, but <laughs> uh, I, I'm a little nervous about this project. It's a huge apartment building going up um, at the, one of the busiest intersections in the county. And, the, and it's being justified under the rationale that these are all retired people and they won't be going out to work during rush hour, but they will be having people coming in to, to help them, you know, nurses, nursing assistants, there'll be emergency vehicles coming in. To, to imagine that the impact this apartment will have will be zero is, uh, I think, a little naive. And so we may need that money to see what problems come up and, and what we can do to solve them. Okay. All right, so <clears throat> shifting gears, um, MCPS, Montgomery County Public Schools for the Uninitiated just released a 200 page district wide boundary analysis. The final report, uh, according to its terms, examined existing conditions and had the goal of providing a resource to the Board of Education to better understand district wide issues related to future boundary conditions. The final report does not make any specific boundary recommendations. In a Related story, the former Woodward High School on Old Georgetown Road was raised to the ground earlier this month, maybe, maybe it was in April, to clear the way for a newly constructed Woodward High School to alleviate some of the crowding conditions in the, um, in, in the high schools in this area. So the question arising out of all this, what is your position as to what 
it, whether uh, the town of Kensington resident children should continue to be within the KP, um, Kensington Park, Wood North Bethesda, Walter Johnson cluster, should the town itself take a position and should the town have a seat at the table where discussions about how to utilize these boundary conditions in order to do the uh, boundary recommendations? Should the, the town have a seat at the table? Um, and I guess generally the question is what can the town or the mayor council do on behalf of its residents on this issue? Uh, I believe I'm back to Connor. Sure. So I've been tracking this specific issue and actually the, the study for the better part of two years now is the liaison to MCPS. And the first thing is, do we have a seat at the table? We already do. Myself and Mayor Tracy are at all of these meetings. We're engaged not only at the Board of Education, at MCPS uh, facilities meetings, but also in this boundary study analysis where we participated in, in most or all of the ones that were open to our area. The reality is this study, this 178 page study that you alluded to, Sean, it groups five models together to say, hey, there, here are five strategies that the county could deploy to bring the underutilized schools up to a level of utilization and the overcrowded or overutilized schools down to an average that is, is good for all schools. But one of them keeps clusters and the four other ones do not. And so the real risk here that I see is years ago, you know, 20 years ago, the town was trifurcated. It was split apart with different parts of the town going to three different school clusters. We were able to unify around the sense that we have a sense of community about the cluster that we go to, and we want to stay together. My real concern is more so that utilization, be, you know, model two, three, four, and five, if adopted, and then they start to move lines around, would result possibly, and I think very realistically, in the town being split up again. And I think that is something that we don't want. And that is something that we are engaged on. And we are advocating at the Board of Education, at the County Council level, um, up through the MCPS level, that as a town, it is very important to our identity to keep our kids together in the same cluster. Okay. Uh, Tim, I'm gonna go to you. And if you, want to ex if you want to go past the one minute mark, please feel free to. I thought Connor was giving a good substantive answer. So I let him go past the clock, but I'd invite the other candidates to take a little bit more time uh, if you desire um, on this issue. So the, the question, uh, the question, Tim, is should should the town have a position? Is is it the is it your position that the uh, that that the town should um, that the town's town's resident children should continue to be in the same cluster? And uh, what what should the town mayor and council do? Well, the town should definitely be at the table. Uh, this is a very emotional issue. Um, on the one hand, there are certain clusters that are way over uh, capacity, uh, and that's a serious problem. On the other hand, um, you, you've got a lot of people who are very emotionally attached to a, a particular cluster. And I know that's always been true here in Kensington, you know, we always, my kids all went to the Walter Johnson cluster. So um, I don't want to, to set out a, an opinion that I would impose on anybody else. It, it, again, it's an issue that we need to bring the town population in on. Okay. Darren? I, I, my kids went to KP. Uh, I was the listserv moderator there. We have a deep connection with the school and, and I think it's a great school and it's a great community school that we're all involved in. Sort of go back to last year's, you know, they always say the generals fight the last battles. Um, there, there was some speculation that what we needed to do was to avoid being redistricted into a different school district to protect our property values. And I thought there couldn't have been a worse argument in today's world than to say we can't be redistricted because we wanna keep our house values. We need to emphasize what the factors are that the county is considering. And so I think we need to be highlighting our connections to the to North Bethesda, KP and, and Walter Johnson. I think we need to, as Connor alluded, we need to stay, stay as one town in the same school district. And, and 
you know, at, at that point, I think the argument becomes clear that, that we belong in Walter Johnson uh, as a matter of historical uh, you know, inclusion and, and because it makes sense for where we are. Okay. So, <clears throat> so let's talk a little bit about the town's traffic. Um, I am approaching my 20 years anniversary as a resident of the town. And the very first issue in which I engaged in the town had to do with traffic. And 20 years later, it's still here. Um, let me start with the main thoroughfares, the, the Knowles, Connecticut, Pliers Mill University, and the various intersections. Is there any reasonable hope for traffic relief along these corridors? Tim, I'm going to start with you. Well, yeah, the, the one big project that's being worked on that could offer some relief is the summit access extension. Um, the Department of Transportation did a study back in 2017 uh, laying out the options. I'm not entirely sure where the process is right now, but I think we should uh, we should really get on them to try to get this project done because that's that's the one biggest thing we can do to help. Beyond that, you know, the, the county is still growing and in all probability, that means the traffic congestion is going to get worse. And so we need to start thinking ahead for creative solutions, the, the next big creative solution to help relieve traffic congestion. Okay. Darren? Sure. I, I think that there are very few people who oppose the Summit Avenue extension. It's something that the town council has supported unanimously ever since I've been on it. It, it was included in the sector plan in, tw in 2012 after sort of falling out of it in the 70s. Um, as far as where it is, they have completed the phase one study of the feasibility of it. And, and that was what Tim alluded to in 2017. And it is currently in the phase two um, uh, stage, which, um, you know, depending on funding, it uh, should be um, wrapping up in the next year or so. After that, you have to go to the uh, detailed planning for it, which includes right-of-way acquisition. So we're going to have to take a couple of businesses that are in the way. But uh, given the potential for this project to provide a, a workaround for the town, um, you know, it, it's, it's critically important. It will not be a silver bullet. We will still need to consider other approaches. And one of those approaches is, thank goodness, I'm mean, not thank goodness, but it, it's courtesy of the pandemic. We don't know that rush hours are going to go back to the way they were. Just today, we heard President Biden express an interest that um, maybe a lot of federal workers will be able to permanently work from home. And so before we make big decisions about school boundaries or about traffic, I think we need to get a little bit of a breather and, and see where we're, we're coming post-pandemic. Okay. Connor, is the Summit Avenue extension, is that, uh, is, is that relief? And uh, if, if the Summit Avenue extension somehow gets stalled, it, do we have anything, any other reason to hope with our uh, major thoroughfares? Right. I mean, the Summit Avenue extension is the project. That's why you heard Darren say it. I'm glad to hear uh, Tim say that everybody is unanimously in support of it. To those who aren't familiar with it, you know, Connecticut Avenue gets about 60,000 cars per day. Now, this was calculated, you know, pre-COVID, but 60,000 cars that aren't coming to our town, they're coming through our town. And the Summit Avenue extended, if built, should be able to give relief or, or move somewhere around 6,000 cars off of Connecticut Avenue. That's roughly 10%. But it's also all those cars that are coming through Pliers Mill, then to Knowles, making a right, then turning left on Summit. It, all of those cars are out of this, this area of high congestion. So yes, the Summit Avenue Extended is that project. And we almost lost it. You alluded to what happens if it's not gonna to come to fruition. As it comes out of phase two, we have to go into the detailed study. Additional funds are gonna be needed by the county council. We almost didn't get to phase two. The town had to step in and advocate with our county council member, Andrew Friedson, to get it reinserted into the FY 2021 budget. Had it not been, we wouldn't even be in phase two right now. So 
I can tell you we are highly engaged with the county council and the county executive to move this project forward because it is the only project that can help to bring relief to that complicated corridor of traffic. Okay, let me um, let me shift gears to our the more residential roads. We we seem to have a patchwork of restrictions, timed restrictions, do not enters, to, uh, turn restrictions. Um, is it your thought that these that this patchwork is working? Uh, do you have any plan to propose any changes to it? And should the town undertake an effort to come up with a uh, to, to do a general study and come up with a uniform system of traffic control and calming. Uh, I believe I am up to Darren. Sure. So they've been, those rush hour restrictions have been in place since I moved here 24 years ago. Um, I think they generally work. Um, I, I, my saying for life is don't make the perfect the enemy of the good. I think they deter more traffic than, they, than their removal would uh, allow in. Uh, the challenge that we've faced in recent years is, quite honestly, ways in Google Maps that um, somebody coming into town, uh, coming through town who wants to get to work can program their work address and Waze finds them uh, complicated workarounds. So sometimes where people, only the local residents knew how to get through our town during rush hour, suddenly Waze is showing the world. And so we are exploring on the traffic committee some, some modifications to it. And uh, when I um, spearheaded the, the, the through traffic restrictions in the west side in the pitchfork, um, one of the first things I did after those signs went up was I went into Waze and I reprogrammed to have those restrictions reflected. So it's a, it's a tech battle of technology, but I, I think we need to keep it going because we don't want the, the, the cut through traffic coming through our streets. Okay, Connor, the current, current system working? Do we need to overhaul it? Do we need to have a, ge a general uniform system throughout the town? I think, you know, to Darren's point, is it working? It, it works to a point. I think part of the challenge is there are expectations that it will work absolutely. And I, trust me, I live three houses down from a do not enter PM restriction. And so, you know, when I was commuting more into the office, I would come home off of Stony Brook and I would have to bypass my street and come around simply to avoid it. We couple that with enforcement. The signs only work as well as they are enforced. We are adding, right? We've I've talked about this before. We're adding this fourth officer to help enforce the areas where we are seeing um, more and more citizen complaints about, you know, traffic violations. But to Darren's point, you know, we're battling technology, right? As traffic continues to seep, a, a wise man once said, uh, traffic is like water, where you restrict it one place, it will find another way. And that's what we see. And, and so our congestion around Connecticut that we talked about, if we can get greater relief there, the hope is it will keep the majority of traffic on the major thoroughfares so it isn't spilling off and technology isn't it taking it in these you know, back roads way through our community streets. Okay. Tim, you've lived here for 30 years. So you've seen, <laughs> you've seen these uh, restrictions. You're, you probably know them pretty well. Yeah. Are, are they working? It. Well, I did get a ticket once, uh, but because I forgot what time it was. Uh, but I, I think uh, there's a good, uh, there's a need to go back and re revisit all of these. Because um, in particular, um, the signage on Kent Street, uh, you're not allowed to turn left on Kent Street if you're headed south on Kensington Parkway. But what mo an awful lot of people do is they just go right through that intersection, make a U-turn and come back and turn right on Kent Street, which, uh, is not, which is not illegal, but which sort of defeats the whole purpose. So th there are some areas where we could re-examine. Um, I think some of the, uh, some of the streets where there's no um, no passing, um, no no passing during rush hour, they they might 
might be a candidate for more enforcement to to keep people from the temptation of breaking those signs. Okay. Um, let me ask about, uh, we, we traditionally talk about at these forum, the uh, walkability aspect of our town. I noticed certainly with the pandemic that there seemed to be an awful lot of families adopting dogs and going on dog walks. Are, are we at a point right now where we are, uh, where we are where we wanna be as a walkable town or do we still have um, steps that should be or could be taken or should be taken uh, in order to make it even more walker friendly? Connor? Simple answer, no, we're not there yet. Um, so I live right off Metropolitan Avenue. It was, you know, it, it's a state highway. Cars are flying day and night. People are using that route to get to Mark. This is a pre-pandemic, right? Getting to the Mark station, getting to the farmer's market. So one of the things that, the first things that I did getting on the council was engage with SHA that we needed better restrictions there. Solera came along and gave us an opportunity to put in a temporary stop sign at St. Paul Metropolitan. And we kept hounding SHA and we've gotten them to agree that they will keep that as a permanent always stop. And they will then go in and put in rapid flashing beacons at Wheatley and Metropolitan. But there's other areas of town where we have very complex ways to get across Connecticut Avenue, right? It's six lanes of traffic. You can only cross on the south side of the intersection. You can't cross on the north. You got to cross into a land island and, and, and then, you know, try and dodge the rest of the traffic. So other things that I've brought up that I wish to continue working on I want to see a reduction in speed limits on state highways. And I really believe that this is necessary for Kensington. If you look at Wisconsin Avenue, Georgia Avenue, Veers Mill, University, they've all had a reduction in their speed limits to lower than 35 miles an hour, either 30 or in some cases like Wisconsin Avenue, 25 miles an hour. That's the same kind of speed control we need for our residential area so that we can make Kensington more walkable through our center commercial core. Tim, are we walkable enough? Um, I think there's been some good improvement since I've been here, but no, we're not, we're not there yet. Uh, there are still some very unsafe places to walk. There's been places where people have pedestrians that are, are killed by traffic that's just going by too fast. And I agree with Connor that um, reevaluating the speed limits is one good way to go. Um, um, uh, I think more, maybe more signage, more more enforcement. Uh, um, these are all things we need to explore. Aaron? Sure, I, again, I think we made some good strides. I, I think um, part of it is in the old system uh, where uh, the, the Maryland Department of Transportation primarily wanted to move cars, um, it was harder to get attention paid to pedestrian safety. And now that all of them are coming around to where we kind of were in the beginning, which is uh, highlighting pedestrian and, and bicyclist safety, we're, we're making progress. As Connor mentioned, I, I honestly think that the, um, the stop signs at Metropolitan and St. Paul are huge. I think that uh, the enhanced pedestrian crossings that we, we're working on are great. Even some things as simple as uh, painting the, the crosswalks to be more prominent. And so instead of two parallel bars, you have, uh, like you do in the, um, in the district, you, they're, they're much more visible and apparent to, to drivers. Uh, there are other approaches that we're considering when we hear about pedestrian safety, we think, well, would a sidewalk be appropriate here? That raises issues with <laughs> residents because they love sidewalks, but they love them on the other side of the street from the one they live on. So we've had a little bit of a challenge getting um, acceptance of new sidewalks, but we're always open to them. I think I, I think I hear agreement among all three of you that continuing to focus on pedestrian safety is a, it would be a priority for all three of you and you're, if you were elected to council. Is that a yes? Absolutely. Yes. Yes. Okay. <clears throat> All right, a related but slightly off the topic question a resident had has the observation that a growing number of vehicle owners seem to be dead set on making their vehicles as loud as possible. 
to a level which this resident is certain violates the law. Um, the resident notes that several of the roadways through the town though are state highways. So there may be a jurisdictional issue. Their question is, will you as a member of the council address the issue of vehicle noise and find the appropriate county or state officials in order to find a way to um, reduce this nuisance? I am at uh, Tim. Okay, well, I did have a teenage son at one point and all of those things that make cars louder are supposedly ways to increase the car's power. Um, so this is something that's been going on for a long time, but we definitely want to make sure, I mean, whatever, we, we want to make sure that people are, are living within the restriction, noise restrictions for, um, for the town. Um, because uh, since I no longer have a teenage son, I, I notice it too, yeah. Uh, and we need to be uh, cognizant of this. Should the town be proactive on this, Tim? Should, you know, find, find other ways other than the state and county officials, maybe signage, maybe, you know, devices that measure the decibel age so that they make people aware that we know that they're uh, breaking the law? Um, yeah, if there are, uh, if there are um, devices that can measure the decibels, maybe we want to put them in. It, uh, if people, if too many of our residents are complaining about this, we definitely want to look at it. Okay. Aaron, noisy yeah, I'm gonna vehicles. That, I'm going to speculate that the people who tune their engines to make them loud and more powerful are probably not going to pay attention to signs telling them that, or they may actually try to hit a new record on that sign for, for where they get. Um, let me just touch, go back to the question of county friend or foe. Um, I had a resident raise a, a different concern to me. Um, and so I called 311. I thought, give it a try. You know, I've never called them before. And I first reached you know, the person who was routing the calls in the right direction. And then the very next day, I got a call from somebody within the Department of Environmental Protection. And the next day, this person came to town and visited the person that I'd raised the concern with. So I, I do think that there are things at the county level that they can probably do better and more efficiently than we can. If somebody calls in a car, a complaint about a car making a lot of noise, it's going to be gone before even our fastest code enforcement officer gets there. Okay, Tom. So um, I will say on the north side, you know, right by St. Paul Park, uh, Plyers Mill just seems to be one of these roads that is taking people, you know, east to west um, with modified engines or modified exhaust, and they make. Mm -hmm an unbearable amount of noise. So I get the question, I, you know, I hear it frequently. I would be very hesitant to putting in any sort of electronic signage that depicts to the driver what the decibel level is because to Darren's point, I think without any ability to enforce that on the spot, what you're gonna get is people racing that sign to see how loud they can get. It's going to become a drag strip. And I don't, I, I, I really would caution against that. But the other thing is the county knows this is an issue. The county is trying to address the issue. Report it to non-emergency, report it to 311. It's all data driven. So the more people that report it, that you give the idea of where it's occurring by intersection or address, they are compiling that data and it helps them to address enforcement zones. We, you know, we can gather the data as well, but it ultimately comes down to the Department of Environmental Protection or MC. Uh, PD who's going to enforce it. So we need to get the data to those two agencies. Okay. Well, I just, I just, uh, I just took my first glance at my clock and realized that we have already, uh, we have already chatted for about an hour and a half here today. Um, so, um, and it's, it's been a it's been a, a good informative chat. What one of the early uh, chat messages that we received was that the three of you do seem to agree on an awful lot. Um, 
I was a, I was going to start the night with a question and then I, I, I decided against it, but now I'm going to, I'm, I'm now going to uh, use my discretion and bring it in, which is uh, the question of why you? And what I mean by that is we've got, we've got three candidates who uh, appear to know the issues. They know the town. They love the town. Why should the voter vote for you? Why, in, in your case, uh, Tim, I'm not going to have you choose which one you'd rather defeat, but uh, that, would be, that would be kind of nasty. But why, why should the voters pick you oh, and, and, uh, and not return one of our sitting council members? And to our sitting council members, why should they pick you over, um, over the other two? And uh, why, why should we not allow a, a longtime resident his turn on the, on the council? And I'm going to start with uh, Darren. Sure. Why you, Darren? Why are we voting for you? Well, I, I have spent a lot of time working on complicated issues. Uh, uh, Summit Avenue Extension, for example, requires a lot of knowledge about um, why the project got sidelined in the 70s, why it got put back in, in the 2012 sector plan, uh, what sort of issues we're expecting from uh, people who might not support it, and what the various stages of that project are. Um, we're in phase two. This is a project that is really make or break for you know, relief, offering some relief for us. Um, and so I, I think, you know, I, I, I applaud Tim for, for wanting to be part of this. And um, I hope he'll, he'll be involved, um, even if he doesn't beat one of us. But um, I, I do think that it requires sort of a, a, a working knowledge for, for things that are underway. Okay, Connor. Sure. Why, why, why are we voting for you? Well, I think the first thing is look at the four years that I have under my belt on the council. Many of the themes that we've seen tonight are about the importance of things like coalition building, about stakeholder outreach, about engaging with county and state administrative officials to get things done on behalf of the town and its residents. And that's exactly what my last four years has all been about, right? The, the things that I keep reminding people of, the stop sign on Metropolitan, the rapid flashing beacons, the, the picnic pavilion, these are all things that occurred because I reached out to those other stakeholders. We built a team, we tackled the issue, we got the result for Kensington. Thrive 2050, right? You know, the comment about the fact that we need to build a coalition, that's the only way to move the needle with the, mm -hmm. the council. And that's exactly what we did. I talked to Tracy, I explained my position that why this was so vital and we needed to do this. We reached out to the next neighboring municipality. Then we reached out to the next neighboring municipality. And then all of a sudden we had a coalition of 23 different municipalities and civic organizations speaking with one collective voice about what was important to the 50,000 residents now, not just the 2000 residents in Kensington, but now 50,000 residents all across this down county area, right? So reaching out to our businesses during COVID. You know, uh, the biggest thing, honestly, I just love, I love this town. When COVID hit, uh, I had a lot of free time on my hand because there were no youth sports. So I immediately turned to our town manager and the mayor and said, where do, what needs help? What can I help with? Hey, farmer's market needs help. All right, uh, Saturday mornings for the better part of several months uh, to a little bit of chagrin of my wife uh, because she remained at home with the four kids, jumped in to help it operate. Can I put together a Zoom thing for our businesses on PPP? Yeah, let me do that. Can I get, you know, I reached out to council member Fried saying, hey, would you be willing to demystify all this reopening stuff with our businesses? Yeah, let's do it. So the idea is if there, I want to reach out and build these networks that help to make Kensington even better. Okay. All right, so Tim, same question. Why, why, why do we vote for you? Why do we select you to be on the council? Well, I am running primarily to bring up some new issues. Uh, this the Thrive 2050 is, is going to have a profound difference on, on the town of Kensington. All these ZT, ZTAs, uh, like uh, particularly the one to um, turn the, uh, turn our mark station into a, a uh, metro stop would would have a profound difference uh, for the town, and 
I want to talk about these issues. I want to, to if I'm elected, I want to really communicate more with the people. I want to find new creative ways um, using uh, social media or whatever. I think, you know, I, I've watched Al Carr come on uh, our listservs and uh, Facebook page, and he's really done a good job of trying to keep the public uh, informed. And I want to, to pick up where he has left off and um, do everything I can to let the people know what is, what is happening. Okay. Sean, if, if I could just for a second, because there's just one point that I want to make sure people leave with. Um, there is can not- Can you put that in your closing? I can. Okay. I will. <laughs> not telling you what to do. Um, I'm going through the chat box to trying to pick up as many uh, additional questions. So if it seems like I'm, uh, I'm all over the place, it's because I am. Uh, what are your views on restricting or prohibiting the noise and air quality pollution caused by leaf blowers? the way the town of Chevy Chase has done. Leaf blowers, are they an issue? Uh, Connor. Sure, so we've talked about this as a council. You know, the idea is are gas powered leaf blowers an issue? Um, there's, you know, a push to uh, restrict gas powered leaf blowers. I mean, I get it. Yeah, they're noisy. There's a lot of, of yard crews in here. The issue always comes down to enforceability, right? So great. There's a new restriction that is put onto the books at the county. We, had, you know, if we adopt it under an ordinance within the town, who and how is it going to be enforced? Because what will happen is it is on the books, but just like the noise ordinance for vehicles, all of a sudden somebody fires up a, a leaf blower. Whose job is it going to be to go and determine? Is it gas powered? Is it battery powered? Is it, ha you know, is it exceeding a certain decibel level? That's the part I haven't seen yet. That's the part that I get it. I, the noise is annoying, especially the more that we work at home, but I haven't heard what the plan is for enforceability yet. Okay. Tim, should we be looking at leaf blowers? Yeah, we sh I think we should be looking at them. Not, not only are they noisy, but they're very polluting. Uh, they put a lot of CO2 into the atmosphere, which we really don't need at this point. But again, uh, but I do agree with Connor that, um, how exactly you enforce this is, is, is a difficult issue. Um, this may be something that would be better off as an educational campaign than an actual code restriction. Darren? Sure, I've given it a little bit of thought. Um, I've looked at what other municipalities have done because that's always a useful starting point. First, I, I find it interesting that these other municipalities have, have banned them, but not for another year. And I, I think they're sort of trying to figure out what is happening. Um, I myself have a battery powered, you know, cordless battery powered leaf blower, and it sucks. I end up putting it back in the shed and I grab a rake because it just doesn't work. And so I rake my yard and that's probably the quietest we can be. Um, sure, the two cycle, Leaf blowers are loud and obnoxious, but so are two cycle gas powered um, lawnmowers. And we've seen a transition from those to four cycle engines. And four cycle, um, the four stroke uh, leaf blowers are available. We've already asked the, the town manager and, and staff to consider as ours um, need replacing to replace them with them. They're quieter, they're more fuel efficient, more environmentally responsible. But man, if we ban uh, gas powered leaf blowers, we're gonna have somebody inspecting whether they're two stroke or four stroke. I mean, that's a tough thing to, to do. All right, well, gentlemen, I have, uh, I have concluded the prepared questions and the questions that have been submitted by town residents. I uh, thank you for your answers to these questions. Uh, as I indicated before, um, you now have the opportunity to present a closing statement um, of 90 seconds. And uh, based on our previous uh, technologically correct algorithmic mm -hmm. system, 
Tim is going first with his closing statement. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, again, thanks to the uh, to everyone who's helped put this together. Uh, as I said in the beginning, I think we are facing major new challenges. The county estimates that there will be 40,000 new households by 2030, mostly in the already built up down county. Change is bound to happen, but it can be done well or it can be done poorly. The town council needs to be proactive to try to deal with these issues as they come up. Traffic congestion is going to be an ongoing problem. The Summit Avenue extension was taught, studied in 2017 uh, and it still has a long way to go. We need to be an advocate advocate for this. Even more, we, we need to be looking ahead to the next big creative solution to ease traffic because you just can't put in 40,000 new homes and not expect more traffic. I have faith in the people in Kensington. We have a highly educated population. Who knows what creative solutions are out there? I want to try to communicate more with Kensington residents and listen to all the ideas out there. You can get in touch with me at any time. My contact information is on my campaign sheet. I see a good future for the town if we all work together. And I ask you for your vote on June 7th. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Uh, second up with the closing statement is Connor Crimmins. Yep. Uh, so first, again, thank you, Sean, for moderating, Rob, for timekeeping. Uh, this was a wonderful event. I want to thank Tim and Darren uh, for an engaging conversation, because this is an important event for residents to understand our positions, but also to understand what's going on with the town. Over the past four years serving on the town council, my priorities have been around pedestrian safety, around uh, helping our small businesses, around improving the transparency of our government, and the communication of our government, reaching out and trying to make sure that people know what's going on in the town, not just our official town meetings, but the events, food truck night, all these events that have been gone for a year and a half, but they're, they're going to come back. We are going to make sure that they come back. But additionally, it's taking a, a, a dual focused approach. It's both the micro and the macro. On the micro, yes, I worked very hard along with the uh, Mayor Tracy, along with Darren, to get the stop sign at St. Paul and Metropolitan, to get the rapid flashing beacon, to help get that, the, the Hawk crosswalk over by the HOC building, mm -hmm. to advocate for the Summit Avenue extended. But on the macro, it's also being involved in things like the, the boundary analysis study with Montgomery County Schools, being engaged on Thrive 2050. We're a small, wonderful town of about 2,000, just over 2,000 people but we have to act bigger than, than our size. We have to you know, have a better batting average than just our 2000 people. And that's through coalition and stakeholder building. And that is what I've been concentrating on over the last four years, reaching out to county council, the county executive, administrative staff, state agencies, county agencies, building relationships so that when we need a question answered, when we need a specialist, when we need to advocate on, for the town, when we send an email or we send a phone call, they respond. Right? They pick up the phone because they know who we are, they understand our positions, and they're willing to engage with us to further the town's mission. Thank you, Connor. And third um, is Darren Bartram with a closing statement. Um, thank you again to the people who helped organize this. Um, I hope people have found the, the forum useful. I have a record of eight years and I'm asking you to consider to demonstrate my willingness to spend the time to tackle complicated and nuanced issues for the town. I've established trusting relationships with others at the county and state level, including planning staff, and county engineers, so that we're working together. Um, I'm committed to making sure the town provides the services we promise, basics such as trash collection and attracting, uh, maintaining our streets and parks but I'm also focused on attracting new and desirable ventures in town. Uh, we're a big fan of Wine and & Company and other businesses there, and, and we're working to expand on that. We defeated the self-storage project, and now we're looking at how a small retail development might be compatible in this space, given the traffic and, and other considerations. Uh, we are all well aware that the county is interested in, in increasing down county density, 
And our approach, our response to that has been already twofold. One is work with coalitions to make our voices heard at the county level where decisions are made, but then also look at our unique status as a town and figure out what authority we have to opt out or to control some of this increased density. The post-pandemic era gives us a chance to reimagine Kensington, not to ignore its historic features, but to preserve them and create an, an oasis from some of the busier areas around us. I'm looking forward to ways to reset some prior assumptions, how bad traffic is, how some of our downtown areas shut down at just 5 p.m. And I'm looking forward to a chance to continue with you in these pursuits. Thank you. Thank you, Darren. That concludes our program for this evening. I too wanna to thank some people. Um, thank you first to Darren Bartram, Connor Crimmins and Tim Willard. Um, I know personally how, um, how hard it is and how, how at times stressful it can be to throw your hat in the ring. So I really appreciate the fact that all three of you are willing to serve our town and uh, as, as a member of our council. I also, also wanna thank Rob Sachs, my uh, timekeeper here. Um, I, 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 if in, in, under different circumstances, we would be in the same room and we probably would have done a lot more sharing of the ball, but um, thank you for your help tonight. Please remember the election that we, uh, we just heard from the candidates occurs on Monday, June 7th. It's both, it's both a live event. You can actually go to town hall and um, cast your ballot. Anyone who uh, would prefer to do a vote uh, not in person can um, receive an absentee ballot and follow the instructions there and, um, and vote. Um, I would be thrilled if the town could at least come close to the participation of the last election. So with that, um, thank you to all who, um, who uh, got on this chat and listened to these candidates. We have, um, I, I think that what's always great about this town is we, we always seem to have um, choices where um, there are no bad choices. And I think that you, would agree, you should all agree that uh, we are presented with that once again in this election. So with that, I say good night. Thank you to all. Go Kensington.